Uh, this last session provides a unique opportunity for us to learn from three highly qualified speakers reflecting on their respective national experience in submarine programs. I'll go ahead and uh, we'll introduce all three speakers and then we'll let them go through their individual talks. Our first, our first speaker uh, is Admiral Gary Ruffhead. Admiral Ruffhead was the 29th Chief of Naval Operations for the United States Navy and held six operational commands, including command of both the Atlantic and Pacific fleets during his distinguished naval career. Admiral Ruffhead is currently the Annenberg Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institution, uh, and he'll be speaking on uh, experiences with U.S. submarine programs. Our next speaker will be Vice Admiral Michel Acre. Uh, Admiral Acre started at DCN in 1973 as an electrical engineer and participated in the design and build of nearly every French submarine class uh, since during his impressive shipbuilding career. Uh, he retired from the Ministry of Defense in 2003 and joined DCNS. He was most recently the Senior Vice President of Technology for DCNS and now serves as the Special Advisor for Submarines to the COO. Our final speaker will be uh, Dr. Hans Christoph Atspodin. Uh, Dr. Atspodin studied law at the University of Bonn where he earned his doctorate. Uh, began his career in the legal departments first of Otto Wolf and then Thyssen. Uh, he's had a highly successful career serving Thyssen Group in increasingly demanding business leadership roles. In 2013, he was named CEO of the Industrial Solutions Business Area, which was formed through the combination of plant technology and marine systems business areas. So we have U.S. experience, French experience, and German experience, again, uh, with this uh, uh, highly uh, skilled group of individuals that are going to be forming this panel session. That will Great, Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, and I'd like to thank Aspie and Peter for pulling together such a terrific uh, collection of perspectives and, and creating the venue for a, a good discussion on something that's very important. Uh, I'm going to talk to you from the perspective of an operator and also the perspective of someone that was responsible for delivering capability uh, to the nation and having to write the checks to do that, which is a, not an insignificant thing. I don't use PowerPoint because after four years in the Pentagon, my therapist has me on an eight-year hiatus from using PowerPoint slides. Uh, I will also tell you that I'm not uh, a submariner, but the reputation uh, and the rumors that floated around in the last 10 years of my career uh, were that I had gone over to the dark side. And I'm an unabashed advocate of submarines. Uh, as an operational commander, there is no arrow in the quiver that is as valuable as a submarine. And for those chess players in the audience, I always thought of a submarine as an invisible queen. It can do everything, you just don't know when it's going to appear. And that to me is the true value of a submarine. Um, there's no question, as was pointed out uh, yesterday, that the growth of submarines in the Asia Pacific region uh, is, is taking off. Uh, and it will not, in my view, be retarded. Uh, clearly a strategic decision for Australia. Uh, other countries, Japan, India, China, Singapore, now Vietnam, uh, Bangladesh acquiring submarines, uh, some serious users, and then perhaps there are a couple of navies in there, to use the term that was in Robert Kaplan's book, that they're buying the bling that a submarine gives a navy. But submarines are here to, to stay. I'm not going to talk about the technology, about the detailed design, or the detailed programmatics. There are others that have talked about that and that you can seek out later. But I'm going to talk about the imperative and the total approach necessary for an effective and an enduring submarine force. For me, as uh, a fleet commander, as an operational commander, and as the leader of my Navy, 
It's not about the submarine. It really is about having an effective submarine force. As we have heard throughout the day, and as all of you know, uh, there is no better intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance platform. And let's take away some of the political niceties, and it's the best killing machine that can be in any Navy's inventory. Because at the end of the day, the best way to sink a ship is to put a hole in the bottom, not a lot of holes on the top. And only a submarine can do that. As a strike platform, it's unparalleled. And it was mentioned yesterday the number of missiles that came out of submarines in the Mediterranean that decimated the Libyan air defense system. But it's also clear, and as we've heard today, that a submarine force is very expensive. Uh, and for us in the United States Navy, uh, that cost is increased by the fact that it's also an all-nuclear force. And it's that way because we have to cross two great oceans to get to where we want to be. And we have to have the speed and the endurance to retask our submarines globally to include transiting and operating under the polar ice cap. So size for us is clearly an attribute. And I will tell you that in all of my years, I've not found it to be an operational restriction. But size also will allow us to capitalize on the future of undersea warfare, which in my opinion is going to be in unmanned systems. I prefer to use the term robotics because the future of undersea warfare will have unmanned swimmers, crawlers, and places on the ocean floor where things are that contribute to this network of which the submarine will be the smartest node and which will be the source of taking in all of that information uh, to serve as a, as a more effective uh, capability. And I will tell you uh, that I could not be more pleased with where the United States Navy is today uh, with having the Virginia-class submarine coming into our inventory. Now, this may come as a bit of a surprise, but um, in my household, there is one other person who is a greater advocate of the Virginia class than I am, and that's my wife, because she's the, sub the sponsor of the USS Minnesota, one of the newest ones. So I can't say anything bad about Virginia class submarines in our household. But I will also say that a great submarine force uh, is, is not just about the submarine, it's really about what I would like to refer to as the submarine ecosystem. And I think that's how it has to be thought of. And as I looked at this ecosystem that supports the submarine force, and it really applied to all aspects of programs that I looked at in my past life, that I always looked at them through three lenses. One was the mission. What is it that you want this thing to do? The base. Some might say the industrial base, but for me it's an expanded industrial base. And then something that all of us in this business have to deal with, and that's a budget, of which there is never enough of. That's just a fact of life. Now on the mission, what do you want it to do? And the question there is, how good is your crystal ball in assessing what that mission is? Trying to predict the operational and the threat environment out into the decades is really hard stuff. Uh, how do you come to grips with it? What is your analytical capability that you have in place, not just at the outset, but throughout the entire process and the life of this ecosystem that you want to have in place in your country? What's your modeling and simulation? But you have to keep coming back to it, and you have to have people that believe in it, but at the right time exercise the professional skepticism based on years of mission experience. In our case, and in, uh, in my last life, I had to deal with the Ohio replacement program. And I will tell you that that's a great intellectual exercise when you consider that the last boat of that class will come off its last patrol in 2080. 
So how do you envision what the world will be like in 2080? A world, as we saw on the chart yesterday, where technology is accelerating faster than any of us are really comfortable with. You have good people who come up with good ideas. Uh, they're motivated. They want to give the sailors the best mission capability they can. But how do you balance that out? And I will tell you, without getting any in, into any detail, the first discussion I had on Ohio replacement, I questioned some very expensive things that were going into that boat that had no bearing on that submarine's mission. Good people doing good things. And in the case of the United States over the last decade, a river of money flowing into the Pentagon gave us the opportunity to do a lot of things. That river is not flowing as full as it has in the past. So how do you take a look into your future programs and say, OK, this is where I am now, uh, but budgets will rise and fall. And how do you sustain that capability throughout? And I think that's a, a key part of it. How do you maintain the proficiency of the people that you send to sea in your submarines? What's the investment that you have to make in that? How do you refresh the technology that's on board the submarine? Uh, I will tell you from my perspective, and the submariners in the audience may disagree a bit, but I believe we went through a period where we had the means, we had the technology, we had the drive, that we were refreshing the technology too quickly. That when I would go aboard a submarine, a sailor would say, it's great to have this new stuff, but about the time I get ready to really get good with it, they take it off and they put a new version on. So how do you balance that out? And I think that's an aspect of it as well. With regard to the base or the broad industrial base, what does it consist of? Uh, your research and development, your modeling and simulation. Again, these are things that in my mind have to be in play all the time. Um, and it goes beyond the R&D that's in the government. Indeed, the R&D that is in uh, the private sector. We rely very heavily on um, university talent and intellectual capacity. And even though it's not necessarily a submarine example, uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. A couple of years, we shot down a satellite with one of our Aegis uh, ships, a failing satellite. We tapped into the R&D community, modeling and simulation, and we knew before we went forward and said we can do this, we knew we could do it. Uh, because we were able to pull on that, it was current, they understood the evolution of the system over many years, they understood the challenge, they had the intellectual capacity to do it, and I think that's an important part to maintain, and it goes just beyond that one mission area. What are the technical standards, and what is the organization, and who are the people? that you have in place. And we're very fortunate, especially within our nuclear submarine community, to have what I consider to be uh, the best of breed in the, in the technical world. The builders, the craftsmen, uh, the talent that really knows how to put them together. And you saw some numbers of forecasts for what exists in Australia this morning. Uh, but that is something that I always paid attention to. Uh, what's the, the industrial capacity? And what are the second and third tier suppliers doing? And I will tell you in the United States right now, that second and third tier in some areas is getting a little brittle. Uh, because as the numbers drop, the quantities that the small companies produce for the programs, they're having to make very fundamental decisions. Uh, do I stay in this business or do I go to another business so that I can continue to survive as a company and my people can put food on the table. Um, and, 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 and I would also say that once that's gone, it is gone. And it will take a long time to build it up. And it's a strategic asset of the nation. And so at times, my view is that it may be inefficient from a pure perspective to maintain that base, but strategically, it is a very good investment to make sure that you don't have to reconstruct it again. On the budget, uh, you have to consider the ecosystem. And I would submit in the case of submarines for subsafe and in the case of the US Navy uh, for the safety 
and the performance uh, of our nuclear power plants, there's no compromise on that. Uh, on subsafe, if you don't keep up with it, you now have a new surface ship, which does you no good. Um, we're proud and very pleased in the United States to have a nuclear navy that is the largest operator of nuclear reactors in the world and has the best safety record. That's not by choice or not by chance that that takes place. Uh, and that involves the maintenance and the sustainment and the logistics that go into it. So uh, acknowledging that the budgets are going to rise and fall, that has to be a constant. There can be no compromise, in my view, on subsafe and, in our case, on uh, nuclear safety and security. And being able to look at the total ownership cost and predict that over time uh, is not an easy exercise. Getting to two Virginias a year for the United States was not something that the United States Navy did. It was not something that U.S. industry did. It was the Navy and industry coming together in a way where both realized that it was important, that it had to be done, and the uh, intellectual effort, the ingenuity, the trust that existed, uh, the willingness to put uh, entrenched ideas behind made all the difference in the world, and that's what enabled us to get to the two per year build. I will also tell you that as a Navy chief, uh, even my closest staff didn't know what my real budget cards were that I held to my chest. But I will tell you that there was a lot that was going to go over the side before I backed off on two Virginias a year. And if I had more money, I would have bought more Virginias a year. But I think that's, that's the question of, of where are you willing to sustain it? What are you willing to do with the rest of the force uh, to maintain this extraordinary capability that few nations have? As I look to the future, the attributes that are going to be important are stealth, and that's not only acoustic, magnetic, but also how are you going to be moving information on and off these submarines. That is going to become more challenging from a stealth perspective in my mind. Submerged endurance, uh, the environments that we're going to be operating in uh, will require uh, some very, very careful uh, assessments of how long you need to be able to stay down. Uh, pervasive ISR, in other words, how do you equip the boats so that as you change missions, you're not having to go back to some point and reload some new ISR equipment on them. So what's that investment? How easy can you move that information uh, on and off? In the future, I really do believe that payload is going to need to be larger because we will move into unmanned systems, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the support for special operations forces will be part of the foreseeable future. And in the case of the U.S., that's why we're moving to the Virginia payload modules, not only for uh, unmanned systems, but for SOF and also for strike, which also frees up tubes to do the anti-ship, anti-submarine uh, mission. This is not about purely about submarines, but as I look back on my life and my career in the Navy, there have been two programs that I consider to be very successful in the history of the United States Navy. One was our submarine nuclear power program, and the other was the Aegis weapon system. What were the characteristics of each one of those? There was a total control of requirements. Uh, once the requirements were decided upon, there was very, very little deviation, if any, on the requirement. Once you lock that in, then you're good to go. If there's going to be a change, there has to be a process that takes you through a change that allows you to address the entire spectrum and related aspects of what that change will be. Both of those programs did that. There has to be extreme technical competence in the organizations technical competence on the uniform side, the government civilian side, the 
uh, industry side and what I'll call the intellectual side, the labs, the universities, and the, that, that body that provides a lot of the work that you're going to depend on. Tenacity and intellectual honesty in bounding and rebounding the problems. Because with any program, regardless of how good it is, uh, there are problems. How do you bound them? How do you come to grips with what they are? How do you honestly assess what that problem is and what you're going to do about it? Both of those programs did that uh, extraordinarily well. Dealing with naysayers, not ignoring them. Uh, any program uh, that consumes as much of a nation's budget as a submarine program, an aircraft program, uh, the Aegis weapon system in the case of the example I'm citing here, uh, will have people shooting at them all the time, sometimes from within, sometimes from without. Uh, you can't ignore them. You have to deal with the naysayers. The creation and the sustainment of this ecosystem in both cases if you look at uh, Navy submarine nuclear power and Aegis, there's an ecosystem that is completely tied together that ties the people, the parts, the paper, the computer programs in a way that if you touch one, you know you're touching the others. And so what's your organization and your system to make sure that all the bases are covered? Paying for exacting configuration control. Uh, that requires a co that's a cost to make sure that you do that and that you're able to monitor it. I will admit to you that in the last few years, in the case of uh, Aegis, we drifted a little bit, and I can't begin to tell you how much money that costs to bring it back on track because it, has, it affects everything else uh, that you get in there. Um, at, but at the end of the day, if you get that right up front, you're going to save money, in my mind, over the long, uh, the long haul. Insistence on excellence across the board. Uh, and in both programs, everyone knows what that standard of excellence is. And it's not just within the government. The excellence that exists at Johns Hopkins, the excellence that exists at our labs and our warfare centers uh, is the same as it is on the operational units. Uh, and and it's more than just knowing what the standards are. It's, it's inculcating those standards within the total force, uh, and everyone understands it. But I think uh, those were a lot of the common traits within the programs. But this is where the real, uh, real factor came into play uh, and where the difference is. I think the trend today is that there has been a diffusion of accountability uh, in, in many areas. And that diffusion of accountability is sometimes neglected or not apparent because we now have all kinds of data and all kinds of information that allow us to see everything that there couldn't possibly be anything that would go wrong. So we now have the data, the information, um, and, and that's, that's one thing that we have. Um, and then we have developed uh, organizations that provide great checks and balances uh, over one another. And so, you, you know, there'll be someone that will catch the mistake and someone will be able to check things up. Uh, we also uh, have devolved into what I would consider to be, and again, I'm speaking for uh, my observations, um, the decision making by superficial PowerPoint. Um, and we are drawn to conclusions that people tell us we should conclude as we sit there and stare at the PowerPoint slides that are flashing up in front of us, uh, as opposed to digging in and really doing the intellectual heavy lifting that leads us to, uh, to a conclusion. I would recommend uh, a short pamphlet if you have the time to read it written by a professor um, at, I believe he's at Yale or Dartmouth, by the name of Tufty. Um, and it's called The Cognitive St Style of PowerPoint. And he uses the Challenger disaster and how the decision making was completely corrupted uh, by that. 
So how did these two organizations avoid that? They had two very strong leaders, Hyman Rickover and Wayne Meyer. They were both in place for a long time. One could argue that one was in place for a very long time, maybe a little bit too long a time. Uh, but, but they were the ones that uh, were the strong long-term leaders. And they had a uh, uh, view into this entire ecosystem. They controlled it. They also realized that at least in Washington, D.C., I don't know what it is like in Canberra, that no one in Washington ever gives you power or money. You have to earn it. You have to take it. And the way they did it was through these characteristics and these traits. They had it all together. And as a result of that, they were able to lead these two, two very strong programs. Um, there's no question in my mind as I sit here and listen to the discussions that Australia has a lot on its plate with regard to aviation acquisition, the air warfare destroyer, the new amphibious ships that are coming into the inventory, uh, a new frigate coming down the road, Triton, uh, the unmanned aircraft that I think is going to transform uh, maritime domain awareness in and around Australia and beyond. Uh, but I would submit that um, as we look back on our programs where we had someone of the stature of Rickover and Wayne Meyer who was affectionately known as the father of Aegis, uh, FOA was what everyone referred to him as. And the question that I have is Australia going to have a FOAS, the father of the Australian submarine? Uh, or in the world that we live in today and bright talent that's coming along, maybe it could be the mother of the Australian submarine. But, but I really do believe that in taking on a program as strategic and as broad as, and as all-encompassing, uh, the question that I would ask as you look at the submarine program is who is in charge? In the case of our nuclear power program, in the case of our Aegis weapons uh, program, which were extraordinarily successful, I can tell you with certainty, because I have been there, there was no question who was in charge. There was no question who was accountable, and there was no question who set the standards. And I believe, as you talk about a variety of things and look forward on what is clear to, the, to be a challenging uh, endeavor, the most important thing will be who is in charge. And it can't be a matrix. It can't be a collection of people. Someone has to own it. And that is the American perspective that I offer to you based on the experience that I've had in 40 years in my Navy. Thank you very much. And now for the French perspective, uh, Vice Admiral Michel uh, Akari. Well, <clears throat> then I will try to give you my, my experience of, the, of building submarine, which is not the same level than Admiral Rothhead. It's rather the level of the shipyard. But I think that we are not very far. Then uh, the question is, what, what makes submarine building different from building other kinds of warships? why some experienced shipyards sometimes encounter major difficulties in submarine programs. What do the successful submarine programs and successful submarine shipyards get which others are missing? These are some questions I will try to answer. First, submarine buildings require an industry with some specific skills and specific know-how. Second, as uh, you say in English, it takes two to tango, and for submarine program, it's the same. It takes a procurement able to manage requirement and contract, and it takes industry able to design and build a submarine. And they have to work together very closely. 
I will present our experience of 50 years of successful submarine building. Actually, we built submarines for one, more than one century, but I'm not that old, then I cannot tell you what happened before. And, our and also, I will try to explain you our experience of the last 10 years uh, of efficient contractual relationship between DGA, or procurement, and DCNS for the Barracuda program. And eventually, I will try to draw from that and from our experience of transfer of technology to other nations some lesson for the benefits of C1000 program. I'm, I'm sorry for John Coles this morning. We say that we, you cannot learn without failure. I pretend that we, you can learn also about success. First, the industrial aspect. From industry point of view, I see four specifics to submarine buildings. First, the outstanding importance of safety and of some other skills and know. Second, the need for a specific industrial env environment. Third, a dedicated R&D program. And fourth, an harmonious and confident relationship between the stakeholders, the designers, the integrators, the shipyard, the suppliers, the procurement, the Navy. So. First of all, the ut utmost and constant concern of the submarine builder must be safety. It's not new because it's something I already heard several times uh, during these two days. But I think that you never insist enough on these points. And it's safety of the submarine when diving, safety of the shipyard, safety of other aspect of safety is another story. But safety of the submarine when diving is a specific problem. You have to take, and there is no compromise with that. I quite agree with Admiral. It requires a strict enforcement of demanding design rules, but also special purchasing and acceptance process for the materials and equipments involved in safety. It requires training and qualification of the workforce. It requires specific quality control and test procedure. It's not just quality insurance as usual, but it's specific system that the submariner attending this conference already recognized as what is called subsafe in English-speaking navies. In France, we call it sécurité plongée, but it's really the same concept. In other words, it means that everybody in the drawing office, in the shipyard, in the supply chain, must realize that the life of the crew depends on his professionalism and act, and act accordingly. It's difficult to build. It takes time to deploy. It costs money, and it's never definitively acquired. But it's mandatory when you want to build submarines. It's clear that this requirement for safety was made even more demanding when we introduced nuclear propulsion. But nuclear safety is not that different from uh, from uh, subsafe, because as you everybody knows, the PWI, the pressurized water re reactor, has been invented by submariner for submarines. Then you find the same philosophy, actually. There are other skills uh, are which are necessary for building submarine, like uh, noise reduction, for instance. But I will not extend today. I think everybody knows. But Safety remains the most. Second point is the need for a submarine industrial and technological base. The technological differences between civilian and military surface ship are not that great, actually. It means that many types of equipments can be easily purchased from suppliers of civilian shipyards. And you, you can count on the development and improvement of the civilian uh, naval industry. For submarines, things are different because of pressure resistance, safety, low noise and vibration level, shock resistance, and all this makes that you need special 
the water valve special hull penetrator, special steel for the hull, and so on. It means that all this, above all, all these equipments and materials are often concerned by a safety certification program like SubSafe, and the supply, supplier must be certified through a specific qualification program. That means that you need a very specific supply chain, a very specific uh, industrial basis uh, to build submarine. And above all, the problem is that series of submarines are sometimes short, and sale opportunities for these equipments are limited. It means that the submarine builder is at risk of seeing his industrial base disappearing between two contracts. The only solution is to try to build around the shipyard an ecosystem of certified suppliers by developing partnership with these precious suppliers. It's quite, it's quite a job. The third point, specific to submarine building, is the need for an R&D program dedicated to submarine technologies. Uh, actually, innovative technologies often requires important adaptation to be fitted on board submarines. Uh, if you take a good example, I think is the, the lithium ion battery, which is something with, we expect uh, major improvements in submarine performance with, this, with these things. Actually, all of us, we have uh, this kind of small thing with a lithium ion battery, which is w eight watt hours, I think, as far as I know, in a car, you have to put 10,000 of this kind of thing, which is already a difficulty. On a small size submarine, 2,000 ton submarine, you need 1 million. It means that you just can take, you just take uh, 1 million smartphone and put them together. It, you have to develop a completely new technology in order to uh, put this inside a submarine with a necessary safety level. You should find the same kind of character specific for hydrodynamics, for instance, because a submarine, hydrodynamic for a surface ship and a submarine is quite different. And you cannot count on all the progress of hydrodynamics for surface ship, including civilian, for submarine. You have to develop your own research. The, these three specification, sp these three specificity are very simple to understand because they are due to the fact that submarines sail underwater. And <laughs> but there is another one which is more difficult to understand sometimes. And this first, this fourth difficulty is something which grows wi rapidly with the size of the ship. Because submarines and especially large ones, are among the most complicated man-made objects. Not only because of the technology or the size, but also because they are built from a huge number of elements interacting strongly with each other and to be assembled in a very limited space and with a very stringent constraint on weight. It requires a strong coordination between the architect, the drawing office in charge of the detailed design, the yard itself, the purchasing organization, the main suppliers, and even the procurement agency, if there are some uh, government furnished equipment. All these players must be able to exchange information and take decisions rapidly and efficiently at the right level during all the detailed design and building phase. And also, and even during the setting to work and the test process. And for that, they have to be trained to work together. They must be very conscious of, at each level of what decision and trade-off they are allowed to make at their level and what change in their interfaces they may negotiate and what must be referred at higher level. It's not just a matter of uh, what is called today a PLM, a product life cycle management system in the CAD system and uh, configuration management and so on. It's first a question of men. 
I think that building a submarine could, could be compared to a concert. For a concert, first of all, the orchestra needs a score, which is uh, the design of the project schedule. It's, of course, something which is a data. It requires a conductor who is an integrator of the submarine. And the orchestra must be trained to play together, which is probably the most difficult thing in this, uh, in this project. Because for chamber music, I mean for a small submarine, uh, you know, you have no conductor usually. They, are, they know, to, they know the, the score, they play together naturally. For symphonic orchestra, you need a conductor and you need a very strong training in order that each instrument starts at the right time, exactly at the right time, and play with a good tempo. And that is something you cannot invent in one day. It's really something which has to be built in the, on the long term. I cannot tell you what is the limit between chamber music and symphonic orchestra. I should say that it's probably something around 3,000 tons. Because the example I have is that uh, uh, <coughs> uh, we had a cooperation with uh, Bassan, who is no, known as Navantia today. Some years ago, we built together a submarine. I will come back on that later. And uh, we had no problem with sharing, uh, sharing the design and building both parts of the submarine at 3,000 kilometers apart. And everything went well. It was like chamber music. Some years later, they decided to build a submarine which must be something like 3,000 tons today, I think, and they did not succeed. And I think that some, there is something, there is a limit somewhere there. Just an example. And then during the last 50 years, DCNS alternated design and building of small and large nuclear and conventional submarine without a gap. And it's really a great chance we had. Uh, actually, when I was in Cherbourg in charge of detailed design of submarines, we, is, is, uh, well, we had the Le Triomphe class to design. And at the beginning, the middle of the 90s, beginning of the middle of the 90s, I, w I I see nothing behind, no new program from France. And fortunately, we had a contract from Pakistan, from uh, Augusta 90. For, it was something of a new submarine. And it allowed me to start again the team and training them again. Even the submarine was smaller, but anyway, it's sufficient. And also the reason why at this time, we decided with, uh, with Bassan again to develop a new submarine because they had the same problem as us. If they do not develop a new submarine, they will lose their know-how. And we developed this submarine together at this time and it closed the gap between the last, the SSBN and the Barracuda. Then, second aspect after industry is procurement. I not, maybe I'm not authorized to speak of procurement because I'm no longer on this part. Anyway, I will try to explain you because I think that the way we work with DGA today is, and with the Navy too, is very, it's a good one. Because actually in 2003, we were still part of the Ministry of Defense at DCNS. And uh, it's in, the, in 2003, the Ministry of Defense decided that we become a commercial company. And it was the opportunity to build a new kind of contractual relationship 
for worship programs between DGA, which is the equivalent of DMO, and us. And DGA had two main objectives, actually. They want to set up a design-to-cost approach in order to get the ships at the price planned in the long-term budget of MOD, with the needed performance anyway. And they, were, they had the dream of any procurement organization to have a contract at fixed price, instead of cost plus fees, for the whole series of ships. And DGA, Navy, and DCNS jointly prepared a negotiated Barracuda SSN program contract along this line. The design co to cost required close collaboration between Navy, DGA, and DCNS with the objective of progressively designing a ship which fulfills the capacity requirements of the Navy and not si simply a set of technical specifications to the target cost with the best trade-off between cost and performance. It took some time, actually. I think four, five years. But it was. Then, DCNS was designated as a prime contractor and technical design authority to allocate the main suppliers, to the ma to main suppliers, the performances, the weights, the volumes, the cost of their equipments, and eventually checks that the ship's design is still technically coherent and in line with the target cost. The commitment of procurement on a long-term contract for the full series of submarines, the six submarines, was another opportunity of cost reduction because uh, you can improve building methods, optimize the time schedule, integrate the learning curve in, the, in your price, and uh, benefit of price reduction on longer series of equipments. The fixed price contract is the holy grail of any procurement agency, as I told you already, but usually it's considered as too risky by many shipbuilders, especially for a new class of ships. Uh, as any company, DCNS has to access precisely the risk of the program before committing on price, time of delivery, and performances. It could be done because we have a very precise preliminary design of the ship with an assessment of all the risk of the, of the program. And in, on this basis, we were able to take a contract at fixed price for the six ship, the six submarine, five years of maintenance, the five first years of maintenance of the six ship, and the part of the specific equipment, uh, the specific um, uh, installation ashore. I think that we succeeded that because we were able to discuss with confidence between the three actors. And because DGA gave us a full technical design authority on concept design and on choices of technologies and equipment. Above all, I think the way we succeeded because we had enough experience as submarine integrator to be able to identify the risk and to propose efficient mitigation me measures. Third aspect which is transfer of technology. Of course, I described what happened in France for French program. All this experience can be transposed to Australia. It's not equivalent. I have no, I have no answer today. I just tell you how we did already in some case. In the 70s and the 80s, we started transferring technology in Spain this Basan, which is now Navantia, built two series of four submarines on the basis of sea proven design. It was the S60 and 70, the S70. In the late 90s, KSW in Pakistan built KSW in Pakistan uh, built two Agosta 90B 
submarines after on the job training on the first of class who was built in France with their support. Currently, Mazagon Dock in India is building a series of six Scorpion submarines and things are doing well today. The lesson learned from this kind of transfer are that all these shipyards were able to build submarines with a high standard of quality and safety without major technical difficulty. However, it requires a strong assistance from the original building and things went much better in Pakistan than in India from the beginning because they had on-the-job training on the first of class. It took a little bit more time to Indian shipyard to start on the first ship. But at, at last it happened. And I, I would like to speak of Scorpion class submarine program, which is another successful story of TOT. Uh, the concept design of these ships was done by DCNS, but the detailed design and building were shared between DCNS and Basin. It was for the reason I told you already, we wanted to keep the competence on submarine jointly. The four parts was built, designed and built in Cherbourg, aft part designed and built in Cartagena. And the final assembly and the test of the ship was done in one country or the other. Because we had this old relationship with uh, the, the shipyard and we had a lot of uh, things made to, together before, uh, everything went perfectly. We weld both parts of the submarine. We, we test, everything was okay. And I think it's uh, because we had a good, we had uh, an integrator was uh, the leader of the thing, and, but, and we had also a good common training of working together. The important point there, and one of the reasons of the success was that we did not try to do all the detailed design and send the, the plan, the drawing to, to Bassan. We say to them, you do the detailed design in your shipyard because you build it. What we are currently doing with Brazil is probably the most ambitious submarine program on the basis of transfer technology. The final target is for Brazil to design, industrialize, and build a series of six SSN based on a Brazilian nuclear reactor after having built four conventional scorpion. It started with on-the-job training of a Brazilian team in France on the four parts of the first conventional submarine, then the building of a series of four scorpions in Brazil, currently, by a company called Itaguai Construction Navalas, a joint venture company between the Brazilian company Odebrecht and the CNS. Uh, this ship, I, I will not expand more. The only thing, the interesting thing I want to, to say is that we, we trained during one year a team of, of about 40 engineers from the Brazilian Navy to design a submarine. And now they are back in their country, they are designing their submarine with the support from DCNS. And up to now, the, f the first project they did seems very good. In conclusion, we also build uh, the bases, the base uh, and the shipyard, but I have no time to expand. Uh, in conclusion, building submarine is not shipbuilding as usual, as you know. A shipyard cannot be converted from surface ship to submarine from day to day. And in any case, it requires the support of an experienced submarine designer and, building, and builder who will bring its submarine technological and industrial base and its knowledge and practice of subsafe and other specificities of submarine, like noise reduction, weight balance management, etc. I can see three levels of challenges when building a submarine in a new shipyard. 
First, to build a series of already sea-proven submarines, it mostly requires some specific industrial equipments and training to submarine techniques. It's something we did already and many times. The second, the second solution is to build a series of especially designed submarines. The first question is the commitment of the designer to the final result, but it's not specific to submarines. And I think, of course, it will be more difficult. And in this case, I would strongly recommend to build the first of class in the, desi in the designer shipyard with a strong team of the, risk of the, uh, the, 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 the final shipyard in order to have good on the job training and to facilitate this transfer later. And the first solution is the Brazilian one, which is something which is more ambitious, which is to build a complete ability to design and build submarine in the customer country. It's something which is feasible too, but it's more challenging. It's up to you and we are ready to bring uh, our uh, support to C1000 projects uh, on the basis of this experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our final speaker uh, who will present the German experience is uh, Dr. Asplodin. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I have to say I know some of you look a little tired after two days of listening. Uh, so I have to say thank you very much for still being here. Uh, but also thank you very much uh, again for SP to give me the chance to present on building submarines the German experience. Actually, it is not a German experience but a very international experience based on know-how with lots of different clients around the world, each and every of whom has his own submarine requirements based on individual and specific strategic and operational necessities, very much like here in Australia. I will come back to that later. Since this presentation cannot go without telling you who we are, I first of all would like to introduce ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems, which is a business unit of ThyssenKrupp Industrial Solutions, as the chairman has already told you, which again is part of ThyssenKrupp, a Germany-based major industrial conglomerate. During our last fiscal years, we had on average quite a good order intake and therefore have a fairly healthy order book of more than 8 billion euro currently. This shows our current order book, um, which we are working on, with a lot of, or a majority of submarine orders compared with the surface vessel orders you can see at the bottom of the slide. The form of our naval business today is a result of the enormous changes that have swept Europe prior to and following the financial collapse that shook the world 2008-2009. Even before the crisis, the build-up of shipbuilding capacities across Asia drove changes across the industrial landscape, particularly in shipbuilding and heavy engineering, with, which strongly affected shipbuilders in Germany and all over Europe. In 2009, the drive for survival united, in our case, the shareholders and the employee organizations behind a draconian restructuring. We managed to dispose of underutilized and unproductive assets and focused our skills on high-end specialized technologies such as submarines, frigates, and ship design, resulting in fewer people, fewer assets with same level of turnover. Tough times called for tough measures and it had to go. Today, we have turned into a predominantly white-collar, high-end naval system integrator and plant technology house, being especially capable to share the work with foreign partners, as we already do in many cases. The consolidation of our shipbuilding businesses is largely complete. The situation today makes an interesting historical comparison. If I could draw one thing from this long history that is invaluable and in irreplaceable, 
I would simply say it is experience. We have made some of the mistakes ship designers and builders make, and we have obviously learned from those mistakes, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Our business model is entirely dependent on a market that recognizes the quality of our products and the experience we bring to the table. This has forced us to continuously improve and develop our technologies, system, and processes. I would therefore argue that besides our technologies, experience is probably the most valuable commodity TKMS sells. Increasingly, our customers want to build and design their own submarines. What they require from us is not only the know-how, this is what they can get from a number of shipyards and suppliers around the world. What is more important to our customers is our know-why. What is the difference? The know-how allows you to copy an existing technology or system. The know-why enables you to adapt and evolve it. And this know-why cannot be easily transferred, but can only be accumulated over a long period of time. Please let me talk in more detail about the TKMS experience. The source of our experience is that today we are a leading, I told you last night, I wouldn't say the leading in front of my highly esteemed competitors, designer and system supplier of conventional submarines and we have accumulated our experience serving 22 countries derived from 183 submarines delivered since 1960, 22 customer navies with long partnerships, some of them greater than 40 years, the only supplier to six NATO non-nuclear submarine navies, a sustained market presence with the largest submarine industrial support base for conventional submarines in the world. The ability to either build state-of-the-art submarines in both our home shipyards or to export the technology to our customer shipyards to facilitate local builds is a critical and unequaled element of our business model and has contributed significantly to our success as a private sector company. Essentially, ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems submarines must be designed to meet customers' requirements including the incorporation of design features that facilitate local construction training and through life support. While submarine designs cater first and foremost for the operational requirements stipulated by the client, striking a meaningful balance between capability, cost, and risk is a critical application of our experience. Underpinning our customer's concept design and the difficult process of balancing risk cost and capability is a crucial need to reference our continuous evolutionary design process using proven components and systems where possible and sometimes also revolutionary technology features like some 20 years ago the first ARP system. This ascertains experience, experienced input into the design to ensure the program risk is managed. The ultimate goal is, of course, low risk, high reliability and availability and a long service life with minimized obsolescence issues. This rests in a design evolution which has been constantly developed through the last five decades in which we could develop ourselves to today's level of experience. As I have previously stated, our experience is our most valuable commodity we sell. Underpinning this is the continuous design evolution process we use and the way in which we undertake it. This undoubtedly pays off for our customers in not being trapped by a price which seems low, it's this slide, which seems low in the beginning but at the end might end up being much higher due to all sorts of unforeseen developments like time overruns, additional quality measures and increased specifications. ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems is the only private company in the world currently operating submarines and our three submarine crews provide design and operational feedback and fulfill in-house development work in addition to their test and trials duties for customer submarines in build. In addition to this, regular feedback from our customer navies provides crucial input into the design process and contributes to ideas and future requirements 
and experience for our engineers. This is augmented by ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems-led user groups, such as SubCon, which is a user conference happening every four years. As you remember, the Chief of Navy yesterday in his speech mentioned MECON, which is just the sister event we uh, managed to do for the users of our MECO frigates. And and on top of that, a new service user group which allow customer navies to share experiences and update themselves on new submarine developments. Even with this vast experience and depth of knowledge, designing a new submarine is not an easy task. The goal, though, is to minimize the risk, ensure that the first of class is not a prototype, and meet the cost and schedule requirements contained in the contract. A tight connection must be maintained between the designer, builder, and customer in order to ensure timely feedback and expedient solutions to any issues which may arise. The closer the physical proximity of the three partners in the project, the easier issues can be handled before they turn into problems. As a private company in a competitive marketplace, ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems has, has had to continuously adapt and improve itself and its products. With limited German national budgets and the end of the Cold War, export contracts became increasingly vital to the, co to the continued health of the company. Export allowed a high build rate with many new designs, thus securing the submarine skills in the company. Continuously retaining these skills over many years requires a mature business model based on a healthy, revolving order book. As the experience and submarine fleet size of many of our customers has grown, so has their desire for in-country build, service, and in some cases, design. To support this, we have, we have adapted our processes, documentation, standards, and attitudes. We recognized that intellectual property rights would be criti a critical element for the order. To date, we have transferred certain design technology into Turkey and Korea to support the indigenous submarine programs. Our challenge is to stay ahead of the competition we may have to face in the future. To suggest that the foreground IP of today's customer is background IP in our next sale simply does not recognize the sophistication or demands of the navies we deal with. Information security processes and the protection of third-party IP are part and parcel of our day-to-day -day business. Our diligence in this regard is fundamental to our customer relationships and future business. It is critical to the outcome that the know-how goes hand-in-hand -hand with the know-why. Partnerships have superseded traditional contractor-client relationships in most of our markets. Partnerships extend to our suppliers with whom we have developed long-term relationships. We share knowledge, R&D, and work towards agreed goals with partners such as Siemens, MTU, and many others. This partner network is the key to managing the cost, risk, and capability balance. With major systems and subsystems we stick with, we, we stick with tried and time-proven supply chains to ensure long-term support for our submarines throughout the world. Nevertheless, we are also able to live up to clients' requirements as far as the integration of subsystems is concerned, which will be needed for clients' operational commonalities and interoperability. This we have learned to do in a long history, which now comprises more than 170 years of submarine building ex experience in Kiel, Germany. Therefore, please let me make the following statement. Only a continuous design and production can ensure state-of-the-art, cost-effective submarines with reasonable risk boundaries. The cost of maintaining the resources for continu continuous design is prohibitive without either a large indigenous program, such as the United States, or an extensive customer base, such as ours. I would now like to share with you some general observations about submarine design and build as it relates to Australia's future submarine program. First of all, I would like to draw on the hard-won experience of ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems and briefly highlight some facts that I believe are relevant to the Australian future submarine program. Customers typically, typically vary the mission systems of the submarine 
for example, the combat system, sonar, weapons, mass, etc., thereby resulting in a submarine with very different operational characteristics from other submarines that are considered the same design of submarine. Therefore, seemingly identical submarines built for two different customers are actually not identical. We have experienced a steady increase in the size of our submarine designs as a direct result of the requirements of our customers. I can see that this is the same experience for Australia based on its requirements for the future submarine program. Therefore, I will make the point that size is not a requirement, but an outcome of all the specified requirements. Having said that, I acknowledge the unique operational environment of Australia and the need for long transits and deployments as a routine part of business that are driving the crew size, range, and endurance requirements. We are offering this experience to reduce the risk when providing an indigenous larger submarine design for Australia. A larger size does not necessarily represent greater risk. If the systems are used, are proven, and have undergone an evolution in development with only a few specific items, such as a main motor, needing to be scaled up, the risk is defined and manageable. Integration between systems is proven, and the partnership with system suppliers that I mentioned before ensures the use of reliable systems. Therefore, from our experience, it is the approach to the larger design, not the size of the design itself that represents or reduces risks. I mentioned crew size, and here I would like to make the point that we have dealt with a broad number of customers, each with their own approach to operating a submarine. One common point amongst all our designs and customers is that technology has allowed reduced crew sizes for the technical operation of the submarine. Indeed, it is my understanding that this is the same in Australia with the experience of the highly successful platform management system in the Collins. From our experience, customers often specify their own selection of mission systems and number of consoles required. This, in turn, coupled with the watchkeeping routines, drives the final crew size. This does not reflect risk. It is simply a consideration that, in our experience, is a routine part of the design process. I'd like to reflect on our experience with the contracting arrangements as they relate to Australia to deliver a submarine with the lowest risk. We have typically worked in procurement activities where there are clear responsibilities and a simple, simple contract model. This approach helps to minimize design, technology, schedule, and cost risk. As ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems Australia is tied into a broader Australian-based ThyssenKrupp network, we have an in-depth experience in handling complex projects in this country. My observation, therefore, relates to an aspiration of a unique design. When considering the final approach to designing the submarine, even with the bespoke design, the use of the proven systems that have been integrated in other classes is critical to overall reliability, availability, and long-term long obsolescence management and sustainment. A submarine, in any case, remains an item of high complexity. Let me see where the slide is. Here. It was uh, striking to me that we have only 350,000 parts on our slide, whereas the French colleagues have 600,000. I wouldn't draw any, uh, any conclusions today from that. The overall submarine can be unique to the individual customer and incorporate sensitive local or allied technologies. However, its individual components and systems should be common to avoid unnecessary through-life costs. Whilst we acknowledge the number of unique requirements that Australia has from our long experience, there are a number of systems within the submarine that will not impact the unique operational capability of the submarine, if common with other nations. This can only be achieved through an experienced submarine designer with a broad customer base that can provide the benefit of reduced risk and loss and cost. Okay, having said that, please let me come to a conclusion. The extent to which experience mitigates costs is difficult to quantify. Nevertheless, in closing my remarks, I would like to be provocative and suggest without access to the detail behind the SP-generated esti estimate of around 
36 billion Australian dollars for 12 Australian submarines, as defined in the Defence White Paper of 2009, that by using design experience and thereby lowering risk considerably, something like 20 billion Australian dollars might be closer to the mark. If I'm right, then perhaps 16 billion Australian dollars could be the experience dividend. This is just my message for the Australian taxpayer, and some of them <laughs> might be here in the room. But beyond this, and very finally, please let me share with you a personal observation and perhaps also recommendation. This debate, which we have seen during the last two days during the con this conference, has undoubtedly its merits for the future submarine journey Australia is currently going to undertake. Nevertheless, as I have been myself part of earlier debates on the same subject already, I do believe that at some point of time rather bold decisions and actions have to be taken. Look at other nations who all have their own very individual submarine requirements, like for example a nation which is represented also in this audience operating its fleet in neighboring seas. They have conducted a very well managed competition between experienced submarine designers and builders, have asked for a clearly described customized solution and then have decided by concluding a contract with the preferred, contra preferred contractor after only 18 months. I'm sure they will operate their new submarines in much less than 10 years from now. The example shows that in spite of all complexities, it is possible to find a way. The experienced designers and builders of submarines are ready to take responsibility for an Australian submarine based on a strong Austra Australian design and industrial input. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you to all three presenters. Uh, we have some time for questions, so we'd open the floor. Uh, questions for the panel. Okay, so back corner, please. Thank you. Re-verify. Uh, two quick ones, if I may. Um, Admiral Roughhead, given that the USN operates an all nuclear fleet, what sorts of technologies, critical technologies, do you see being transferred to Australia, potentially for C-1000? The second question is to uh, Dr. Aspidine. We read in the European media that there's uh, a high level of unhappiness between TKMS and uh, your Swedish subsidiary, Cockhams. Could you please comment on this? Arranged the target. One ping only. Captain, I, I, I just um, clearly yeah, ping for um, you know, One ping only, please. Combat systems, um, and as uh, I've I advocated before in other venues, uh, are there some opportunities for uh, cooperation in uh, moving forward in the unmanned interfaces that may be required as we go into the future? But I think the combat system and, and, uh, and, and bringing together the technical base, the scientific base, and the industrial base of both countries, I think we could move off into a new area to assure undersea dominance together. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Aspidin? Yeah, um, just coming back to your question, actually, as everybody knows, uh, we are the 100% owner of Kokums in Sweden, which uh, in the meantime is renamed into TKMS AB. Um, we have been invited to acquire it 15 years ago. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, now, um, as Sweden has engaged in a national submarine program called A26, um, it seems that we are no longer wanted as a foreign owner. That is our perception. Um, and uh, as, of course, we would have been open to any, for any discussions and uh, fair solutions to this uh, new situation. But there was not much of talking. Uh, recently, there was uh, much uh, more of, let's say, force to uh, um, deprive us of our basic ownership rights and uh, I can only hope that this uh, will come to an amicable solution. Uh, finally, uh, at least I can say we are open uh, for talks and have offered this various times and I hope we will have a good solution for that uh, in time because we feel uh, f uh, for, uh, first and foremost a responsibility also for the employees of the company. Okay. Thank you. 
re-verify our arranged attack. For Admiral Ruffhead, um, Admiral, in your presentation, you're obviously um, a very firm advocate uh, for submarines and you know, stressing their priority and the like. Um, it's interesting, obviously, to see the fact that the, the numbers of subs um, overall in the US fleet is going to decline slightly over the next sort of 20 uh, odd years. Um, my question to you is, while submarines are important, um, is it fair to say that they're not so important as to call for or require cuts in other parts of the US Navy in order to actually fund the I'm talking about the opportunity costs of submarines. Um, it's obviously interesting to see, see a couple of US think tanks that, um, in their analysis of the QDR recently talking about their you know, willingness, for instance, to sacrifice an aircraft carrier or two in order to fund a greater number of submarines. But that's obviously not the calculation the US Navy or the, the US administration is coming to. So I guess that's my point. Is it a case that they're not so important that they'd actually call for cuts in other parts of um, US force structure? No, I think it's a question of, of balance. And uh, I think in any fleet, whether it's the United States or Australia, um, what balance do you want given the types of missions that you have to perform? And given the fact that our missions tend to be global, the numbers that you have generate your forward presence capability, and you're well aware of that. And so, as I mentioned earlier, you give me more money, I'd probably buy more submarines. But I also have to keep all the other requirements in balance as well. Um, that's, that's where we are. Uh, I would submit that uh, as, as, as I look at the future, um, the importance of maintaining sovereign airfields where we don't have to worry about basing rights or overflights is a significant aspect of where we want to be going into the future. Um, our combatants play vital roles, as does our amphibious force, because I believe um, there'll be more offshore activity uh, influencing from the sea support to special operations forces for quick, light, lethal missions. And so designing a fleet that provides that is where we are. And it's, just, it's always a question of trade-offs. Um, you know, Australia could make the decision to not buy destroyers, buy all submarines. But you see the missions that you have to perform, and, and that's the design that you wish to go forward with. That's, it's a question of, of how you design that fleet. Thank you. Next question. Yep. Uh, my, <coughs> my name is Goran Larsbrink, a retired Rear Admiral from Sweden. <coughs> Normally there would be no speakers from Sweden here today, but there are reasons for not being here. And it's just uh, recently that the uh, information about uh, what's going on uh, has become public. And therefore I think uh, it's appropriate to mention a little bit about what's going on, since this has an influence on Australia's choices. And uh, Sweden is today in a process to resume command over its own naval industry, and thereby its own future. And this industry is classified as being of essential national security interest. As wrong it was, as it was to sell Cockham's to HDW in 1999, as right it is today to take it back and re re resume control. In doing so, Sweden will be in control of and have the capability to design, produce and operate our own submarines. As well as to cooperate with whom Sweden wants to cooperate with in order to meet national security interests. All under the umbrella of government to government agreements. And in this, Sweden possess all relevant in IP and can use it as we want, together with whom Sweden wants. And there is no one else that can use it without permission from our government. What is going on now is a swift and determined transition of submarine design and production competence from former Cockums to Saab. The infrastructure for production can and will be solved in different ways. The submarine program A26 is terminated. 
but instead the project NGS, Next Generation Submarine, uh, will arise like a bird phoenix. Furthermore, there is a political will to substantially increase Sweden's defense budget. Thank you, Mr. Putin. Including an increase of our submarine force from four to five submarines. And in this, the government, the opposition, all the defense authorities, and the industry, meaning Saab, are agreed upon and are fully committed that this shall be done fast and successfully. Thank you. Admiral, thank you for those comments. Any other questions? Oh. Uh, please allow me to just comment on this. Uh, uh, Mr. Lasbrink, uh, I think this is a surprising statement. Uh, you have to recognize, first of all, we are the legitimate owner of the company, and we are living all together inside the EU, and I rate it quite surprising uh, if you state here that you just take it back. We could, I, I was not going deep, more deeply into that uh, upon the question uh, I was asked, but with this statement I have to, uh, because the measures to take it back resulted in hiring massively our skilled people without telling us, um, taking away the business license or putting it on hold, um, not providing us with any further orders, the shipyard in total, and thereby destroying the industrial base and the employment base for almost 1,000 people. And this is something which we cannot see in line with legal actions and we cannot see in line with responsibility for a company and for the employees. Okay. Thank you. We did promise you never a dull moment. <laughs> it has been an intense, a fascinating, a challenging two days. Now, yesterday the Minister for Defence told us that the Collins submarine had been in a very dark place. Uh, today, Don Winter uh, told us, or took us to the dark side of project integration. And after two days, I think we've got a very real sense of the significant risks and opportunities which remain in front of us as we shape the right policy options for Australia's submarine choice. Now, at this stage of the day, I don't think it would be appropriate uh, for me to, uh, and I'm sure you will be relieved to hear, that I don't propose to sum up, or even worse, to integrate uh, our discussions over the last few days. And how could I? Um, unlike Mark and Andrew, uh, and quite a number of others in the room, uh, I'm not a physicist. Uh, in fact, I studied as a medieval historian. Uh, and in the nature of university history departments of 30 years ago, um, I read a lot of marks. Uh, 30 years on, uh, there's not a lot of red marks left on me, I can report, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but um, what we at ASPE tried to do with this conference was, uh, no pun intended, to surface the current state of thinking about the submarine choice and to look for the signals and the messages that point to the future of the enterprise. Now, when you are surrounded by the fog of policy, you need to listen for the ping. What do I mean? Well, here's something I prepared earlier. Re-verify our range to target. One ping only. Captain, I, I, I just... Give me a ping, Vasily. One ping only, please. Aye, Captain. Now, I don't know about you, but I think I heard a few pings over the last few days. Uh, the Prime Minister's comments from his Adelaide press conference of a week or two ago were quoted a number of times. We make defence decisions on the basis of defence imperatives not on the basis of industry assistance or on regional assistance imperatives. Ping. Um, and some comments from the minister yesterday. We need a highly effective capability, but not at any cost. Ping. Uh, and on the minister's comments on numbers, let me be clear. 
It's not about the numbers, but about the capability and the availability. Ping, and from Ray Griggs, we're not looking to deliver a science project that lives on the laws of, on, lives on the edges of the laws of physics. Now, overall, I've had quite a few pingy moments over the last few days, and I hope you have too. It's really very important, ladies and gentlemen, to listen for the pings. Now, just before I thank a few people, I've got a big favour to ask all of you. You have um, in front of you, uh, hopefully, two pieces of paper. Firstly, a feedback and evaluation form, which came in your registration pack. And secondly, you have in front of you the small Hyatt Hotel notepads. Before you leave the room, I'd ask you to fill in the feedback and evaluation form. And on the Hyatt Hotel notepads, can I ask you to write down three things for me? Um, firstly, your ping moment from the conference, because this will help us to shape the book of the proceedings that we will start to produce very soon. Secondly, can you write down for me any advice you might have on the, uh, how we can improve the next ASPE conference. Thirdly, um, we are thinking of uh, what we will do next year, uh, and I think after the success of this conference, our intention is to focus in on a major capability project. So, uh, what should we do? C5000, Land 400, uh, if you'd like to write down for us what you think should be the topic of the next ASPE conference, I'd be grateful for that. Now, this can be anonymous, uh, or you can tell us who you are. I don't mind either way. And please hand that to an ASPE staff member as you leave. Thank you to our prime sponsors, to Lockheed Martin and to TALIS. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon Australia, and TKMS. We literally could not do it without you. Thank you. And thanks also for your engagement in the program design. Now, ASPE is a small organisation, uh, and frankly, this has taken uh, a great deal of the organisational skills and commitment of a large number of our small team. And uh, I hope you'll bear with me if I just thank those people very quickly. Uh, ben Schreer. Uh, or Admiral Schreer, as we, uh, as we now call him, uh, in the office. Uh, when Ben joined our staff, I said to him, Ben, you know, you can't just expect to do writing uh, in ASPE. Um, and I said to him, how would you like to run a conference for me? And uh, he took that on with great enthusiasm, um, a sense of um, um, attention to detail, which his executive director would not be capable of. And thank you, Ben, you've done a tremendous job. I really do appreciate it. Uh, Lynn Gozard, uh, leader of our events team. Uh, as always, thank you for the flawless delivery, Lynn. Um, uh, not always uh, calm delivery, but flawless delivery is, uh, is what we expect, and you've done that very well. Uh, to the rest of the team, uh, Cassandra, uh, for uh, planning and registration. Uh, Daniel Nicola, one of our interns. Daniel's been uh, on this uh, project for uh, quite a few months now. He's uh, been unstoppable and unflappable, uh, and I think you'll agree with me, looks remarkably like uh, Clint Eastwood in the Bodyguard movie with his um, little walkie-talkie uh, earpiece that he's been sporting over the last couple of days. Uh, Simone for the uh, corporate uh, relations. Uh, Luke Wilson for website and audio visual. Uh, we've had an enthusiastic team of bloggers and tweeters, uh, Natalie, Christy, Harry and Rod, um, Karen, Thank you very much for the emergency Chardonnay uh, when it was most desperately needed last night. Uh, and to our happy team of interns who've done everything from registrations, logistics, uh, roving mics, all manner of tasks. Uh, lastly, uh, well, my heart heartfelt thanks to all of you uh, from the ASPE team. Could you please give them a round of applause, please? And finally, thank you very much to you. Um, I hope that you've uh, enjoyed your experience. Uh, run silent, run deep, and safe journey home. Thank you. <laughs>